Morning, everyone. I'm James Brooks, uh, uh, Director of NatWest Corporate in and Institutions Business. Thanks, for everyone, for joining our webinar today, where we'll look at the importance of the business case of, of zero carbon commuting. We've got a number of speakers today from a number of different diverse backgrounds, which I think demonstrates the growing importance of scope three emissions and specifically the commute. So why are commuting emissions so important? Uh, I think we all quite like a statistic. Uh, so here's a few to get us going. Uh, current analysis shows commuting emissions generate 18 billion kilograms of CO2 equivalent annually. And that equates to 25% of total emissions and an incredible 5% of the UK's total emissions. It's estimated that 10 billion kilograms of CO2 equivalent could be saved if more people walk, cycle, get public transport or car share to work. Clearly, they're big numbers, but that shows that by focusing on decarbonisation of the commute, the impact can be impact, the impact will be very impactful to reducing UK emissions. Tackling climate change is the biggest challenge of our time, and the NatWest Group is central to our purpose-led strategy. As a leading bank in the UK for business customers and one of the largest, one of the largest retail banks, we've got a significant responsibility to lead the way to help people transition to net zero carbon economy. NatWest is determined to play a leading role in tackling climate change and helping our customers do the same. As a bank, we made our own operations net carbon zero during 2020, and we're working towards being carbon positive by 2025. Working in partnership with companies like Mobility Ways has helped us to understand our emissions and how to tackle them. We hope you find the session today useful and informative. We've got a Q&A session at the end where you can raise your hand or submit questions via the portal to be read out. I'm now going to hand you over to Mark Han from Mobility Ways, who will introduce their company. Over to you, Mark. Many thanks, James. Um, yeah, my name is Mark Hand. I'm the Business Development Director for the LiftShare Group. LiftShare are an uh, independent, mission-driven social enterprise for who, for the last 25 years nearly, have been working with large employers throughout the UK to support them to help their staff share journeys to work. Just before lockdown, we, we hit a key milestone. We took the billionth mile off the UK road network. And it was an exciting time. We were on the trajectory to repeat that every three years. Sadly, of course, when Boris stood up and said, don't go to work and don't car share, that had some implications for the business. And what we did during lockdown was we reflected on how we could best add value in the future. And we thought about some of the things that were taking place through the pandemic. The, the uh, unprecedented speed of change that we've seen in terms of people working from home. And the response of management teams to that actually moving away from perhaps a, a more conservative with a small c view of staff working from home to now a much more uh, open-minded approach to things like hybrid working. We also saw some of the benefits of taking um, cars off the network, people cycling more, actually being able to hear the birds, less congestion and those sorts of things. But on the flip side, an awareness of how vulnerable we are to world events again, sadly being repeated now. And also this emerging theme coming through much more strongly for the majority of people around climate change and the threat. So we came to some decisions ourselves about, as I say, how best to add value. And if we could just move on to a short video, I think we can explain better how we developed mobility ways. And then we start with the stark findings of an international team of scientists led by the UK Met Office. Today's report is yet more evidence that the growing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is changing our climate. The reduction of Arctic sea ice cover and melting of the permafrost has accelerated during this year's heat wave. Terrifying signs of things to come, according to tonight's dire new assessment from 13 federal agencies with potentially disastrous consequences for the planet. However, the last three months have seen some significant changes. And this is the very last moment we have in which we can actually hope to stem some of these disasters. The vision for Mobility Ways is to make zero carbon commuting a reality. And I created Mobility Ways because it's just become really clear that unless we decarbonize the commute, we will fail our net zero goals. The commute is one of the least efficient journeys any of us ever make, and the commute has become the single largest source of emissions in the UK, 
it now accounts for 18 billion kilos of carbon every year. 90% of us travel alone to work every morning. 40% of us could cycle to work, but don't. 40% of us could go by public transport, but don't. 10 million of us could uh, share a lift with someone who lives within walking distance of our house, but we don't share a lift. And yet, we face a climate crisis. We need to decarbonise our commute, and there are solutions there right now that are not only better for the environment, but better for us, better for our pockets, better for our health. We need to change how we travel, and we've seen through the success of our sister brand, LiftShare, over the last 22 years, that there are ways that we can shift behaviours, and it's, and it's proven to work, and we need to do it fast, because in, in reality, we've only got 10 years to really start shifting the dial on this, and we've got to make a move now. If we fail to make zero carbon commuting reality, we will fail our net zero goals. And if we fail our net zero goals, our children will not forgive us. So every time I watch that video, I find it both, both chilling and energizing, really. Um, but we keep coming back to this 18 billion kilograms of CO2e and the fact that it represents 5% of total UK emissions through the commute. When I speak to organizations across the country, and obviously do that frequently in my role, I do find that number varies considerably. And when we're speaking to organizations, particularly professional services, office-based organizations, I've even come across situations where it may be 50, 60, or even 70% of the carbon footprint of that organization. It's something we need to tackle. And there are many benefits to organizations of actually taking a more um, enlightened path, shall we say, in terms of sustainable commuting. So I'd like to just hand back to James to look at one of those first of all, which is around the business case for sustainable commuting. Uh, I'm just going to hand over to, to John Surratt, who will explore, will explore the business case for sustainable commuting, highlighting the key benefits to employers and their teams. Thanks, James. So I'm John Surratt, I'm a director of economics at Jacobs, another net zero carbon uh, company. And what I'm going to be talking about in this short session is just setting out some of the costs associated um, with our commute and the implications of that for businesses and individuals. So if you want to move on to the, the next slide, please. So in terms of some of the data I'm going to be presenting, we devolve uh, transport to the various nations, so it's quite difficult getting some UK figures. So the figures I'm going to present here are for England. They are mainly for the pre-pandemic situation. And some of them, to be blunt, are a bit of a back of the envelope calculation. So some of the numbers I will be talking about are slightly different than those that James and Mark have mentioned. But commuting is a big number, 6.3 billion commuting trips a year. When we talk about billions, I think most of us lose comprehension of what that really means. We just know it is a very big number. If we want to move on to the, the next slide, please. And as sort of already highlighted, a lot of those trips are by car. So almost just over half of all commuting trips in England are by car. It's higher in the, the other nations of the UK. May it surprise you that train is the second most uh, used method of commuting, followed by walking and bus. If we move on to the next slide. But what we find, I'm one of those people who walk to work. I'm fortunate enough to, to live uh, within a couple of miles of my workplace, so I walk to work. But most walk trips are obviously fairly short and therefore journeys when you take into account distance travelled and hence as we move on in a moment to carbon, then it becomes more and more skewed to particular modes of transport. So car becomes more dominant, over 60% of commuting miles are in a car, being driven in a car. And maybe surprising to some of you that rail accounts for about a quarter of all commuter miles. Moving on to the next slide, please, Dan. And that leads to the fact that when we talk about emissions, and I'm going to say with slightly different numbers than have been mentioned, but this is only just for England, 11 million tonnes of CO2 emissions uh, from that daily commute uh, in England, and over, nearly 90% of that comes from cars and vans. So that, that just shows you where the issues are that need to be addressed. It is principally car commuting, which are causing that very high level of emissions. Want to move on to the next slide? Now, Mark's already mentioned the pandemic, and you might think, well, the pandemic has changed uh, people's behaviour. And this slide shows uh, just before Christmas to the, uh, the sort of semi-lockdowns we had over Christmas, and again, people being advised to work from home. And then as we've come out of the restrictions, 
how different modes of transport use have changed over time. And that blue line towards the top is car use. So car use was almost back to pre-COVID levels. 100% is the pre-COVID level. Car use is almost back to that sort of level. Bus in both London and out of London, which are the sort of yellow and blue lines, they've stayed slightly below about 80% of pre-pandemic levels. And it illustrates the fact that not everybody can work from home. Uh, a lot of people in retail, leisure jobs, et cetera, tend to have shorter commutes, tend to travel by bus, and therefore bus travel has held up better than uh, rail travel. And as we can see, rail travel is still struggling. Uh, only 70% of um, pre-pandemic levels on both the London Underground and National Rail. The interesting one is cycling. Uh, again, Mark mentioned at the beginning, you know, when we went into that first lockdown, cycling boomed. But as more and more cars came back on the road, cycling has become back into more of a leisure pursuit. We see huge peaks and troughs in cycling, often related to the weather. And there's a big question mark about whether cycling will continue um, at the same sort of levels or will it would have genuinely grow as we come out of the, the pandemic. Moving on to the next slide. Now, working from home is seen by some people as a great way of getting to net zero. Our commute goes from our bedroom to our kitchen, if we're lucky, to a workplace office at home or sitting around the kitchen table doing our work. But actually, we're in danger of getting the worst of both worlds. We have half empty offices, which are still being heated and lit, and we have our homes, which are being heated and lit. This particular piece of work was done by David Simmons Consultancy for Scotland, uh, it was more of a rural area and hence oil heating is used much more than in other parts of the country. But it's sort of showing um, actually what happens in terms of net emissions when people work from home under different sort of scenarios. So red, the situation is worse and green, the situation is better than the sort of pre-pandemic levels where people are mainly working in, in their workplaces, in their offices. So if you were a long distance loan car driver, producing huge amounts of emissions, and you're now working at home when that home was already being occupied and therefore there's, there's no additional heating or lighting, then that's great. Then that's uh, yeah, a, a major benefit to uh, in, in terms of emissions and moving to net zero. But if you are working at loan and you didn't previously work at loan and you used to walk to work and you're using oil heating, then actually your carbon emissions are far worse now um, than they were pre-pandemic. So working from home is not a panacea. Um, it's not necessarily helping us to move towards net zero. Next slide, please. We estimate there are roughly sort of 10 million car parking spaces around uh, the UK. And as you can see on this great picture, those car parking spaces take up an awful lot of space and that space costs money. We move on to the next slide. We talk about a lot in economics about opportunity costs. What is the cost of doing something different to what you're doing now? Because you're having to provide car parking spaces, that ties up money and resources which could be used elsewhere. If we look at the sort of average rent you can get from a typical town centre parking space or an out of town parking space, they vary anything from sort of 50, 60 pounds upwards to four, 500 pounds a month. And these are sort of opportunity costs that businesses may not necessarily be paying for themselves for that car parking space, those amounts of money. But that's the amount of money that's effectively being tied up um, in that parking space. And on the, the bottom of that slide, if we just go back onto the slide up, we also have a way of increasing taxes um, from parking spaces. So we have the ability to have workplace parking levies in both England and now recently in Scotland which enables the local authority to tax that parking spaces. Nottingham is at the moment the only place to do that. And their charge is an average, it's £35 a month it works out at. It's just over sort of £400 a year. as a charge to the business for providing that parking space. And that money goes back in and invested into public transport. We'll, we'll come back onto that in a minute. Next slide, please. And obviously, um, you can buy car parking spaces and they go for large amounts of money. London, the extreme example, you can buy a, a large four bedroom house in those parts of the country for the price you can pay for parking in certain parts of London. But even a surface level car parking space in a relatively, excuse me, prosperous areas part of Hampshire, but it's still you know, out of big cities, 
would still cost you five figures. So again, it gives you an indication of the amount of money and resource that is tied up in car parking spaces for businesses. Move on to the next slide. And of course, businesses have to pay rates on their car parking spaces uh, as part of their premises. And those rateable values, again, uh, tend to be in the hundreds of pounds per car parking space, which is not only a cost to the business, but it's also a hidden subsidy uh, to their workers who actually drive in compared to those who may walk or come in by a bus or cycle. Next slide. And just to give you an idea of what the relativities are, again, this is a, a business park location in the West Midlands. We've got two office buildings there in the sort of center of the, the slide in the picture. To the left, you've got a multi-story car park, and then you've obviously got a, a big service car park that's there as well in the front of the picture. And the amount of rates paid uh, by the occupier of this site is just over £400,000 a year, of which 20% of that is purely for that car parking space. It is not achieving any outputs for them. That's the sort of money they're having to pay. So it's a tax they're paying on that parking space. So move on to the next slide, please. So bringing all this together, what, what is this business case balance sheet that we're looking at in terms of commuting? I don't say some of these numbers are a bit of a back of the, the envelope type calculations, but it gives you an idea of the costs that society and businesses are incurring. So the annual economic costs of carbon emissions from com commuting are somewhere in the region of £2.7 billion pounds a year and increasing because the value of carbon is increasing as well over time. And as I said, about 90% of that is related to a car commuting. So that's the cost effectively that businesses are imposing on society uh, through those emissions, which are driven by people driving to their places of work. There's a financial cost or an opportunity cost, as I said, uh, of providing that workplace parking. The annual rent equivalent is somewhere in the region of six billion pounds. Um, and that gives you a sort of idea of the alternative rent that could be achieved if those spaces would be used as something else. Businesses are paying somewhere in the region of a billion pounds of annual business rates for those parking spaces. So it's a costly for businesses to provide them. And again, I sort of talked about opportunity costs. What happens if we could get rid of half those workplace parking spaces and repurpose them for residential use? And the values here, obviously the value of land varies around the country. I've excluded London because the values in London are so much higher than elsewhere. But potentially that those half those 10 million workplace parking spaces could support 150,000 homes and the value of the land for residential use could be anywhere up to eight billion pounds. So that's, again, money that businesses have seen tied up, which could be released and used for better uses for society. And what happens if we tax those um, parking spaces? But again, um, the workplace parking levy only applies to sort of small, uh, medium sized to large car parks. So again, a back of the envelope calculation suggests you could raise around two billion pounds a year to pay for provision of more sustainable transport methods if you were to tax those car parking spaces. And if you start taxing those car parking spaces, then the chances are that businesses would reduce those parking spaces. So quite a lot of numbers, some very big numbers in there, but I hope they give you an idea of some of the costs associated for both society and business uh, related to uh, commuting as it happens at the moment and the changes that potentially could arise if we move to a more sustainable and net zero carbon community. With that, I'll come back to James. John, thank you very much for that. That was incredibly useful, very, very helpful. Um, I'm now going to hand back to Mark and uh, to look at, uh, to focus on the product products uh, spotlight, uh, sharing key data and insights from their platform, um, which is supported by NHS Lanarkshire case study video. Um, Mark, over to you. Thanks, James. Um, so John covered, um, I think, very, very well the potential financial benefits for organisations of delivering sustainable commuting. There are a whole range of other benefits as well. And if I could have the next slide, please, Dan. So I would group these um, in terms of firstly impact. And, and by that, I'm talking about net zero. Um, so many of you on this call now will have net zero targets. So you've either got them in place and you're developing them. And so sustainable commuting can support that and, and hitting net zero. But also it's about credibility. And our approach is very much about data led. 
being data led. And if you are going down the route of working with the likes of SBTI, then the data is really critical. And I think that applies equally to scope three as it does to scope one and two. There's also a whole batch of benefits around being the employer of choice, so around your employees. There are financial savings potentially for staff. Um, there are health and well, uh, well-being benefits, both mental and physical. Um, the ability to actually get people through shared mobility to share knowledge um, and to enjoy their, their actual commute more um, and to be seen to be green as an organization. And therefore, all of these things together supporting recruitment and retention, which is a big issue for a lot of organizations at the moment. Building on that, there's also the operational, and, and um, John touched on a number of things around repurposing of parking. Um, what we do in, in terms of helping and have traditionally is, is taking the pressure off car parks, reducing demand for car parks, and that gives you all sorts of options then of what you do with those spaces. And then finally, I would, I would consider reputational benefits. So certainly thinking about your stakeholders, your investors, your customers, and even down to the level of your neighbours and being a good neighbour by reducing congestion and improving air quality locally. So if we can move on to the next slide, I can talk a little bit more about how can Mobility Ways actually help you as a large employer to actually implement successfully uh, sustainable commuting. So we've built a framework. We call the Mobility Ways framework. It's also a dashboard. So everything I'm going to cover will be at a high level can be seen in a single dashboard, and that can be used for one location or multiple locations, and even broken down into teams and departments and so on. But the approach is very much about measuring, reducing, and reporting. The measurement on the right-hand side, starting off with travel survey data. How is it that your staff are currently commuting? What is their behavior? How many are walking and cycling, taking public transport, and so on? And that gives us a baseline position. And it also allows us through a tool that we've created to convert that data into commute emissions. So an understanding of the kilograms of CO2E that each of your commuting staff actually generate through their behavior. So the travel survey and the commute emissions, that's your benchmark. But what we can then do through uh, another piece of software that we've created called Scoping Smart Mobility is to actually understand based on where your staff live. Firstly, what the art of the possible is. What are the travel options they already have as opposed to how do they currently travel? What are the implications of starting to shift that behavior against a whole range of metrics? So whether it's financial savings for the business or for staff, health and well-being implications, and reducing CO2E and nitrogen. And thirdly, where are the gaps in provision? Where are the services so poor that staff have no other option, and indeed large clusters of staff have no other option than to travel alone in a petrol or a diesel car to site? So the measurement side is really important as a starting point. And based on that data, we can then start to think about interventions, whether they be cycle to work schemes, car clubs, car sharing, e-bikes, e-scooters, a whole range of things in terms of a, a sector, the mobility sector, which is developing and evolving very, very quickly. Having done that, we need to get the information through to staff in terms of engagement. So that's both in terms of sessions like this, but also enabling staff to get that quality of information quickly and easily through personalized travel plans that give employees all of their choices, but also an understanding of the implications of the decision they make in terms of which mode to use. Now, when we're working with organizations, if there is a commitment to actually reduce commute emissions, we can certify that organization. And that certification sits very neatly alongside others like Planet Mark, Carbon Trust, and so on. And then there's a constant review and analysis going on through this process to see what campaigns are working, where we can strengthen things, and what the impact is in terms of reducing that A cell. That, kilo, that a level of kilograms per employee being um, created on average per annum. And the idea behind all of this is that we agree a strategy with an organization to take them from wherever they are now in terms of those, those commute emissions to zero. And that's what we want to achieve. Uh, next slide, please. So I touched on um, travel surveys as being 
pretty key to all of this. And, and the surveys enable you to do, of course, a annual review of how staff are commuting, but they also allow you to dig much deeper than that to really understand by mode why people are uh, perhaps not traveling in a certain way when those opportunities exist. So if I could just ask Dan to um, uh, just click through to the next line. So this is uh, on the right hand side, you'll see some work that we're currently doing with Torbay and Devon NHS Trust. Um, there's a survey going on. It's, it's got about a week to run. We have had so far around 1500 responses. Now we've asked initially three key questions. How were you commuting before uh, the pandemic? And you can see the dark blue line that runs across here with quite a significant number, not surprisingly, driving alone, um, and then uh, a range of numbers across, quite small numbers across the rest of the options. Then it was in the lighter blue, how, we, how did you commute today? And there's not a significant difference other than on the far right where you see working from home, obviously playing a key role here. How do you hope to be commuting this time next year was intended to take people's minds beyond COVID. And again, looking at these numbers, there's not a dramatic difference between what's happening now and how people see themselves traveling in the future. But crucially, the next question asked, which of these modes could you be encouraged to use? And if Dan, if you could just click through, you'll see a very different response. So 55% could be encouraged to use public transport. Over 60% could be encouraged to car share and so on. Now, for each of these modes, using the survey functionality, we can dig deeper to really start to understand what is it that would encourage you to travel in a certain way. And if we just click through one more, Dan, we can look at what we found just on the car sharing mode. So for 38 percent, the black line on the bottom, absolutely nothing would encourage them to car share. So clearly not our target audience. But for the rest, some really good indications of the sorts of things and the sorts of actions we need to undertake to encourage them and incentivize them through to actually taking up car sharing as an option. And exactly the same process could be undertaken for public transport, for walking and cycling, and for other new modes. Next slide, please. So based on that type of information, we can then really make impact happen. This is a case study from Arup, which took place just before lockdown, where in just three months, through the introduction of a really successful lift share scheme, combined with the incentives and policies that we'd learned were required to make this successful, we managed to get half of all staff confirmed sharing in just three months. That's not signed up, that's actually using an app that we have to allow people to authenticate their journeys to prove that they were actually sharing. Half the uh, employees in three months with the associated significant drop in commuter emissions and increasing car occupancy levels. And the impact on the right is showing you that ACEL number again. So falling from a start point of 830 kilograms of CO2e per commuter down to 602, which is roughly the national average. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier about ACEL rating and just very briefly what we can do, what we do is we take the travel survey data we apply some key government numbers which are updated annually, such as average distance travel per mode, average emissions per mode. And on the basis of that, we come up with a rating for an organization. As I say, it's a starting point, a benchmark from which we want to drive down to zero. But because we've mapped the entire country, it is possible for organizations to be able to compare themselves both locally and nationally. And the next slide, please. So on scoping, what I wanted to do was just take you through very briefly um, a quick case study and no better than to use NatWest in Gogoburn, where we actually ran the scoping exercise for nearly 5,000 staff. What we found was that 80% of those staff had more than 10 colleagues who lived within walking distance of their own home, who they could share journeys with. We found 75% had at least one viable public transport option, 25% could walk or cycle, and 49% had a park and ride option available to them as well. So significant numbers, and I know Mark uh, Dodwell will speak a little bit later about some of the work that we're gonna be doing as a result of that scoping exercise. Next slide, please. 
So some of the things we found just very quickly, because we have mapping capability that comes alongside the report, what you're seeing in front of you now is, is a look at the home postcodes of uh, staff, all completely anonymous, um, but based against public transport opportunities to get to site. The site is right in the middle. You can see the, the red blob with the black dot on it. Um, that's the uh, location, the work location. And where you see green dots here are postcodes that have at least one viable public transport option. The brown or the oranges you may see it are those who could get a bus, but if they were to do so, it would take them more than twice the time that they would have taken them to drive. So they're very unlikely to do that. Now, this data is absolutely critical for public transport providers to understand where the opportunities are, where there is a, the opportunity to better align their services to the needs of staff. And that's a theme that runs through scoping across all modes. So just moving on to the next slide. This is honing in much more on the lift share component. So I mentioned the 80% of staff who live in a postcode within walking distance of at least 10 colleagues. And the picture that we had for NatWest is a picture that we have seen for all 600,000 people that we've undertaken this exercise for. Eight in 10 commuters working for large employers that we've scoped live within walking distance of at least 10 colleagues with whom they could share. And onto the next slide, please. Finally, honing in on uh, active travel. So the green dots towards the center are those who uh, live within a 30 minute walk of site. Obviously in this case, not huge numbers, but the brown dots or the orange dots again, as you might see them, are those that can walk with it, uh, sorry, could cycle within 30 minutes to site. And that becomes really interesting because what we're able to do is actually target our communications directly to these people to understand if they're not already cycling, why are they not, and to actually incentivize them to do so. And it can also start to uh, get us to think about where we might put e-bikes and e-scooters to best encourage people to actually travel in by those modes if they think the cycling and walking is perhaps a bit too far. Next slide, please. And finally, wrapping all that together, we can understand, and I'm, look, I'm going to point towards the right-hand side of this um, slide now. Based on the scoping report, if every member of staff at Nat West were to travel um, in the most sustainable way already available to them, this shows us what we call the A-cell opportunity. How far could we drive down that A-cell number? Typically, for those 600,000 people I referred to earlier, we find that through behavior change alone, we can halve that number. And next slide, please. And just a reminder that we can get all this information to staff as often as they wish um, through personal travel plans that can show them all of their choices. And what I wanted to do was wrap all that up in a, a short example video um, from NHS Lanarkshire. So if I could ask Dan just to uh, press on to the next slide, that'd be great, thank you. NHS Lanarkshire has over 600,000 residents that we serve. We have over 12,000 staff working in a range of three large acute hospitals and community sites as well. As we've seen from the commentary surrounding COP26, we need systemic and quite full change across all boards in Scotland, um, across all governments as well, in order to reach net zero. Obviously, commuting has a huge impact on that, particularly when we consider staff and patient travel as well, which can't be overlooked. Some of those journeys will be essential, but we need to make sure as an organisation that we do that in the most sustainable fashion. ACEL and, and stroping has been really useful in actually just putting a metric to emissions from staff commuting. Um, it's insight that we didn't have before, but it's allowed us to have that figure to then track and manage over time. It also shows us where staff are commuting from and to, and allows us to then target strategically what sites we go after. Staff travel surveys have been interesting because it showed overwhelmingly that any staff journeys made have been via single occupancy car journey, which I think underlines the importance of what we're trying to achieve. As an organisation, we need to be able to communicate what we're doing, what facilities and resources are available to staff to make small changes in workplace that can add up over time. Some of the initiatives we've put in place to encourage staff to commute more sustainably have been some cycle parking, cycling infrastructure across our three large acute sites, 
We've also seen cycling infrastructure go into our community sites as well. That includes bike repair stands, cycle stands, heated town rails. We have plans to install more of those. I think one of the main benefits staff experience through Mobility Ways is the personalised travel plans. That's a huge benefit. It's never something we've been able to offer. Having that sort of automated through platform is a huge benefit. Even speaking to the staff, I've heard many benefits from just improved mental health. They're getting to work refreshed, ready for the day. I would recommend Mobility Ways as a, a tool for all public bodies. It's a level of insight we've never had before. We're still quite early in, in that journey on Mobility Ways as a platform, but even still, it's been worth its weight in gold. I'm optimistic we can achieve zero carbon commuting. Won't be without its challenges, but there is a real appetite out there. We just need to be able to leverage that and, and deliver that. Mark, thank you very much for that. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Kirsty Austin uh, from the Department for Transport. Kirsty will look at the Commute Zero initiative outlined with the Depart Department of Transport decarbonisation plan. Kirsty, over to you. Morning, everybody. Um, so, firstly, uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, it's very exciting to, uh, in my first month in a new job, actually, be invited to such an important uh, event and. Um, if you'll indulge me this morning, I just want to give a little bit of sort of context to how the department views these issues and uh, the sort of scale of opportunity we see around the commute um, in terms of helping us achieve net zero. So, but firstly, a bit more of an introduction about me. So um, I'm the new deputy director for systems and strategies in the future transport systems and environment directorate in DFT. Um, in the past year, I think it's fair to say that the Department for Transport has become the Department for Decarbonising Transport and reducing other environmental impacts. We take the agenda incredibly seriously, not least because transport emissions are, of course, one of the two big contributors to, to the UK's uh, current baseline of emissions. My remit uh, includes looking at how the government can remove the barriers to mode shift, how we can tackle things like congestion that can have a negative impact on air quality locally, um, as well as looking at how we make decisions about the interventions for future transport schemes that we might do. Uh, clearly, there's a big challenge here in terms of commuting, um, and I won't repeat the statistics that others have already given, but it does, you know, give, given how much of uh, rush hour is really a single cars with one person in them, um, it feels like it's a really good place for us to start in terms of trying to shift behaviours. And the good news is, that as the Mobility Ways team have already shown us, predictability around journeys means that we can capture information and data and start to be creative about alternatives. So I, I said I was here to give a bit of background about the transport decarbonisation plan. Um, I mean, transport itself accounts for 27% of our overall UK domestic emissions. Uh, the opening video sort of made quite a compelling case about why that is an immediate priority for us all to, to work together to reduce. The vast majority of commutes are, uh, journeys are of course commutes, um, but it's quite a complex backdrop really. Um, uh, we've been looking at, as we roll out the uh, electric vehicles mandate, we've been looking really at, you know, is this, is this a war on the motorist? Absolutely not. Um, since 1990, we've seen domestic emissions drop quite significantly in, in, in lots of sectors, but on the face of it, by comparison, transport emissions have only fallen 4.5%. What's really going on is a mix of more efficient engines um, and more efficient car technologies, uh, but a growth at the same time in the number of journeys being taken. And as we roll out electric and hybrid vehicles, uh, we've also seen a road, uh, an increase in the purchase of diesel and petrol SUVs. And as cars get heavier, uh, and more fuel um, hungry, actually we're seeing lots of the positives neutralised out. So we've we've got a plan in place that's quite bold and ambitious to help tackle that sort of, those sort of uh, competing drivers. But naturally, it takes some really bold decisions, and um, and that's why we've been we rolled out the TDP last last July. And don't get me wrong, you know, as I said, this is not a, a war in the motorist. Quite often, actually, when we, we crunch the numbers, cars can be the most efficient option for some people in certain situations. 
Uh, there's a lot, but there are a lot of areas where there are some easy, quick wins around behavioural change. And I think it's one of the key messages that we keep hearing from public consultations across government, not just in DFT, that actually for employees, um, having access to information about how they can change their commute is one of the key barriers. Um, now, you all know your employees better than anybody, um, but if you've, and, and I think the ASL tool is a great option if you if you need help with that. Um, but, you know, in DFT, our staff networks are pretty active at sort of mapping things uh, and helping inform how we support our staff to actively travel, use more public transport, think about uh, alternatives to driving to our sites. We're no longer just central London based, which means that actually, as we relocate to different regional hubs, we're seeing an uptick in the number of people driving into the department. Um, so, 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 you know, we're not, we're not immune from, from some of these pressures and, and we're not in a sort of ivory tower in London. Um, I think it's, uh, so, so, so understanding the data and the predictability is a pretty important part of it. Um, and, and that's why this year we're looking to launch a scheme called Commute Zero. And it was one of the commitments that we made in the TDP. And it's an opportunity for us to bring together employees, uh, employers uh, like yourselves, uh, to think about how we might provide more support and encouragement and take up of no commuting options uh, amongst workforces. So, so later this year, well, early in the new financial year, uh, we will be launching a new scheme in the usual way. Uh, what we're trying to do is reduce that, the number of uh, car journeys that are effectively commute. So at the moment it's one in five. We haven't set a target for what we want to reduce it to, um, but we will be uh, consulting on, on what's what's the most appropriate uh, sort of measurement to try and aim for. Uh, and we're also currently uh, thinking about how we might help employees uh, embrace new technologies like e-bikes, uh, where those are, where they might be appropriate. So um, we'd love to hear more from yourselves uh, and other, other groups, uh, and we're very supportive of what Mobility Ways are doing. Um, and it's really great to be invited here today uh, alongside these excellent speakers. I, I don't really want to um, sort of give too much more background about what we're doing or the transport decarbonisation plan, because I, I have a feeling when we get to the questions, actually, um, that would be a, we'll get into some really good uh, discussion points. Um, but for now, that is the introduction I would like to give. Thank you, Kirsty. That was very helpful. Very good introduction. And, and yes, I'm already seeing a few questions related to that. So we'll come into into a uh, couple of those extra bits within the Q&A session. Um, could I hand over now to Paul Chandler, um, who works for NHS England? Um, he's looking at uh, how scope through commuter emissions fit within NHS's wider net zero strategy. Uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I've got a few slides to canter through, really outlining what the NHS uh, in total is doing uh, on net zero travel and transport and where um, commuting, not just from staff, but patients and visitors visiting healthcare um, centres uh, fits within our overall strategy as well. Um, so hopefully people can see the slides uh, will be on the screen shortly. Thank you. Um, okay, first thing to say is the NHS was the world's first national healthcare system to declare a plan to reach net zero by 2045. At COP, about 14 other uh, national healthcare services um, decided to follow suit, but, but really the NHS is out in front in terms of national healthcare systems on that. It's a huge undertaking. Uh, the NHS uh, emissions uh, in England are about the same as the total emissions of Croatia or Denmark. So a huge, huge uh, uh, job to do there. Uh, next, uh, please, thank you. That table there uh, shows our progress to date through the NHS of reducing our carbon emissions. Scope one and two emissions have reduced by 62% on the 1990 baseline, which is encouraging progress, although we do need to acknowledge that almost half of that is simply through the decarbonisation of the, of the national electricity grid. Uh, lots of other uh, organisations would have seen a, a similar drop because of that. 
Um, our all scopes emissions has been slower. Um, that has reduced 26% on the 1990 baseline. And you'll see from those figures that the progress has been patchy in each five year period, but is now accelerating, which is good to see. Uh, next, please. In terms of our scope uh, emissions, then what do what do we mean? Well, our, our scope uh, one emissions, uh, next please, Dan, um, features uh, some travel and transport emissions there, primarily uh, the vehicles that the NHS owns and, and operates, uh, ranging from uh, a car that a district nurse might use to visit patients in their own home up to an emergency ambulance. Scope three, emissions cover a, quite a broad array of things from uh, business travel, including staff using their own vehicles on uh, trust business, what we call grey fleet, uh, freight, so anything delivered to and from hospitals is in scope for us as well. And uh, in that bottom right hand corner, staff commuting. Uh, next, please, Dan. Uh, interestingly, though, the NHS is also considering patient and visitor transport. Um, so not really technically in, in scope three, this is an additional scope. And we've committed to reaching net zero for those emissions as well in quite an unusual move. I don't think you'll find many large organisations that are considering the carbon emissions of their customers uh, essentially um, accessing their services. So we're taking that on board in the NHS as well because it's a significant source of carbon uh, and other air pollutant emissions. Next, please, Dan. So in terms of the NHS carbon emissions, uh, this is how it's split between the different uh, the, the different themes. Uh, the travel and transport ones are in the top left-hand quadrant uh, and across those various different scopes, 14% of the total NHS emissions uh, come from, from travel uh, uh, and transport. That actually excludes the, uh, the contribution of freight delivering things to and from hospitals. So when that's factored in as well, we're looking at about 18% of the NHS's total emissions come from people traveling to and from healthcare settings. Uh, then we split that by different sector in the NHS. Next, please, Dan. Uh, and uh, unsurprisingly, in terms of the emissions from NHS fleet, acute hospitals and ambulance trusts uh, make up the lion's share of those of those fleet uh, uh, emissions. Um, in terms of um, patients and visitors and also business travel, most of that is concentrated in large acute hospitals. But for patient travel, that's spread much more evenly between mental health institutions, acute hospitals and primary care GP practices and things like that. So a range of different emissions for a range of different uh, reasons and, and therefore a range of different um, solutions that we will need to develop to reach our net zero objectives. Next, please. In terms of recent progress on reducing travel and transport emissions, I think the first thing to say is the net zero team at NHS England that I lead is a brand new entity. We started in October last year, um, but we are starting to see some good and worthwhile uh, progress being made. Next, please. Uh, in the long NHS long-term plan, which is essentially the NHS's five-year strategy, published in 2019, uh, there was a commitment to make sure that at least 90% of the entire NHS fleet was low emission vehicles uh, by uh, 2028. By low emission vehicles, we really mean complying with um, Euro uh, 6D or 6 petrol standards, um, the kind of standards that you would need to be able to drive in London's ultra low emission uh, zone or Birmingham's clean air zone. Um, the good news is we're on track to smash that target. We think that by uh, March 2024, um, over 90% of the entire NHS fleet is low emission vehicles which is good progress, but nowhere near as much as we need to make. Those vehicles are still uh, emitting uh, significant uh, levels of carbon and other air pollutants. So we're certainly not gonna rest on our laws. It's just one important step along the journey. Next, please. There's also been some great pioneering world leading work, actually, with, um, with uh, Ambulance Trusts, West Midlands Ambulance Service has developed the first zero emission ambulance to be in active service. Uh, it's been running for um, a year and a half now. Uh, it's got a range of about 100 miles between charges. It does take between three and four hours to charge up though. So it's a really useful step in the right direction, but certainly not the last word in, in developing emergency ambulances. Next, please. Some of you will have seen a, a COP, uh, the Project Zero Ambulance developed in partnership with London Ambulance Service. It's the world's first hydrogen fuel cell ambulance, so again, a world first. Um, uh, 
This vehicle has a range of 300 miles between charges and can refuel within um, within seven minutes. So really helpful for uh, big rural um, uh, footprints. Uh, the problem being, of course, is that Britain's uh, hydrogen uh, refueling uh, structure is really nascent. Um, there's only nine public hydrogen refueling stations in the UK and only one north of Swindon. So a long way to go if hydrogen is going to be a, an answer to uh, decarbonising uh, national fleets, including the NHS. Next, please. Uh, really, really important step forward um, for the NHS, not just in travel and transport, but in all the work that we do. Uh, we've uh, we've signed on to all of the kind of government-led procurement uh, processes which apply a weighting to tender scores uh, for companies bidding for public uh, uh, contracts. The NHS is going further. So from April 2023, any company that wants to bid for an NHS contract of any type that's worth over five million per annum will need to publish a carbon reduction plan before they're allowed to, to bid for that contract. So a huge, huge step forward, uh, really important for people who provide services to and from uh, hospitals, uh, including transporting patients to hospitals, because one of the thing, early things that they can do to prove their commitment to carbon reduction and to reduce their um, revenue costs will be to switch to lower uh, uh, forms of, of carbon transport, particularly zero emission vehicles. So a huge uh, lever that we can use there using the NHS's purchasing power uh, to, to um, force suppliers really to decarbonise their, their fleets. Next, please. Uh, and also we're working with um, with NHS employers um, to restrict things like salary sacrifice schemes to uh, only include um, zero emission or hybrid vehicles in the future. We need to tread quite carefully there. We need to uh, understand the laws of unintended consequence and we don't want to disadvantage certain groups of staff. So this will need to be planned quite carefully and over time. But that's the ambition, really. Uh, and then to phase in, you know, the requirement to use those kind of vehicles for business travel as well. Um, so they're all really important pro, uh, steps in the, in, in the, in the journey uh, and will make a, a big difference to uh, carbon emissions and to air pollution more generally. But there, there is a, a fly in the ointment. Next, please. Done. A lot of the things we've talked about uh, so far uh, relate to the NHS fleet, to business travel uh, and to freight. But you can see there in the middle, three really big bars in the uh, waterfall uh, chart, um, which account for other areas of carbon emission that are attributed to the NHS. Next, please. Uh, so staff commutes uh, makes up 19% of the total uh, travel and transport carbon emissions of, of, NA, of the NHS as a whole. Patient travel, 29%. Visitor travel, 6%. Now, they're quite difficult for the NHS to influence directly. They are scope three emissions or without scope scope three emissions, but we are committed to tackling these areas, um, starting with staff commutes. Uh, that's the area of these three bars that we've got the most influence on. Uh, and we'll, so we'll be focusing over the next year or two on how we can uh, encourage staff to make that modal shift on a grand and mass scale. Next, please. Uh, and next. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, when we think about NHS staff commuting, there are some confounding factors that might not be completely unique to the NHS, but when you mix them all together, they do make for quite a, an unusual um, staff working pattern that probably isn't applicable to most private comp companies or other entities. Uh, next, please. The first one, the COVID pandemic, you may have heard of it. Um, big impact, obviously, on the on the NHS in many, many forms. Uh, staff, NHS staff were actively encouraged not to take public transport to and from at work uh, during the height of the first couple of waves of the pandemic, both to protect themselves from catching the infection on public transport and to protect others in terms of um, them passing on infections from, from their workplace to other users of public transport. So NHS staff were strongly encouraged to use uh, private transport uh, and we're given free car parking in and around hospitals to, to encourage that. So that's been a big uh, step backwards when we think about kind of uh, co uh, sustainable commuting for very good reasons. But um, but but that's knocked us back in terms of what we do uh, moving forwards. Uh, next, please. Shift patterns are very odd in the NHS. Um, 
a typical nurse will work several different shift uh, patterns during uh, d- during a, a month. They might be on a week of nights. They might be on a, a run of, of days. They might work weekends. So uh, it's not a regular shift pattern. Um, that, that makes lift sharing with a regular partner quite difficult to achieve, for, for example. And often at times when uh, when they're finishing a busy night shift, they'll be seeking to travel back in rush hour uh, traffic or, or at times ill served by public transport. So we do need to be mindful of that in the NHS as well. Uh, next one, please. Emergency cover and response. Lots of NHS staff, mainly clinicians, but not, but not all clinicians, uh, will need to stay on past the end of their shift to cover like emergencies. Um, they're often required to come back into hospital if they're on call to deal with, uh, with uh, work out of hours. And uh, not unusually, they are, are uh, called back to hospital to deal with things like major incidents and emergencies. That also makes relying on public transport and lift sharing more difficult for these staff than it would do for, for other um, professions. So that, that's something we will need to factor in as well. Uh, next, please. A lot of uh, hospitals are specialists offering specialist roles. Uh, if, you know, outside the major conurbations of London and Manchester and those big cities, if you're a specialist radiographer, for example, working in a particular kind of cancer diagnostics, you've probably only got one hospital in that region that you can that you can travel to. Um, if you can't afford to live very close to the hospital, then that, that means long commutes. So a lot of NHS staff commute quite long distances to be able to further their career and to practice the specialist roles that they've trained to do. That again makes active travel and potentially public transport uh, a, a poorer uh, alternative to them in, in some cases. So we do need to be mindful of that as well. And lastly, multi-site delivery. Over half of the hospital trusts in uh, in England have more than one main site, and staff are often required to provide services at, at various sites. So potentially. Do a, do a shift in the morning at one site and the afternoon somewhere, somewhere else, for example. Um, and there's an explicit policy in the NHS for the last 10 or 15 years, really, to move care out of hospital and into people's homes. That obviously affects the, uh, the transport um, choices that, uh, that staff will make, both in terms of how they commute into work in the first place and then how they travel around for work purposes during the, during the day. Next, please. So there's some confounding factors there that will make decarbonising the staff commute in the NHS quite complicated. The other point I should have mentioned is that there are 210 different NHS trusts in England, all with their slightly different policies, their own slightly different set of incentives, their slightly different set of demands and constraints. Uh, We're not dealing with with one policy across the NHS here, we're dealing with 210 sovereign organisations. So that complicates factors as well in terms of coming up with a, a national approach. Uh, but that's what we're committed to do, a national approach to decarbonising uh, NHS travel and transport. So just some highlights of what we're focusing on in the next 12 months. Next, please. Firstly, we've commissioned an expert partner, a company called Senex, who some of you might have heard of. Um, they're supporting us, my team, in the development of a net zero travel and transport strategy across the NHS. And crucially, then, an implementation plan. How will an NHS organisation, whether they are... Uh, a GP practice, a large acute hospital or an ambulance trust, decarbonise their travel and transport systems and processes in a structured and supportive way. That uh, implementation plan it will be due uh, next February. Uh, next, please. There are, as you've seen, some contractual requirements of NHS organisations and suppliers to decarbonise their fleets, and that will that pressure and requirement will build in a stepwise but planned. Fashion. So each year there'll be we'll be stretching the requirements of suppliers to decarbonise their fleets, and we'll also be stretching the requirements for NHS organisations to move their fleets, including grey fleet and business travel, to uh, primarily zero uh, emission vehicles. Next, please. Uh, we, to support that, we're developing a fleet transition tool. This is really designed so that NHS organisations and individual staff can weigh up. Um, the implications of the uh, switching their existing vehicles to uh, primarily a zero emission one, factoring in the cost of of, of, build, of buying or leasing a, a zero emission vehicle on the one hand against the fuel savings, the maintenance savings, savings in things like congestion charge and clean air zones uh, and the residual value of a vehicle at the end of a lease period uh, to try and show people that actually a zero emission vehicle 
is a sound investment now over the lifetime of that vehicle. It will also include things like considerations about what charging infrastructure a, a hospital might need for a typical um, fleet um, to try and bust that myth that, that people are going to need to invest uh, huge sums of money in chargers or electric uh, infrastructure. Uh, that won't be the case for most NHS vehicles. Uh, next, please. Uh, we're also developing and trialling new types or additions of zero emission emergency vehicles. Uh, there's a new uh, generation of emergency ambulances uh, under development at the moment, but we're also rolling out 21 other types of zero emission emergency vehicle in April, uh, ranging from single passenger emergency response cars up to specialist mental health ambulances to try and prove that these zero emission vehicles are capable of um, replacing and even augmenting um, uh, traditional diesel or petrol uh, vehicles for these types of functions. Uh, next. We're also contributing alongside partners like Kirsty at the, uh, the DFT and the Office of Zero Emission Vehicles to conversations about national uh, strategy on things like refueling infrastructure uh, and vehicle replacement strategies um, to try and set the tone really to encourage private individuals, whether they're staff, patients or visitors, to switch to uh, lower carbon forms of, uh, of transport. And last, please. We're also uh, planning to run a target support package with probably about seven NHS trusts to deliver modal shift uh, from their staff, patient and visitor journeys, following really on a lot of the elements that Mark's already highlighted, mapping where staff live and commute to, mapping the options that are currently available to them, understanding in detail why they make certain com commuting um, choices and what might persuade them to, to, to change, and then developing with each participant based in trust a bespoke set of interventions or policies that we can try to see how effective they are in changing staff commuting behaviours, uh, with the potential view of then uh, tailoring some of those interventions to also uh, cover patients and staff uh, and visitors where that's appropriate as well. So that's going to be a really key part of our um, approach over the next 12 months, because as you've seen, uh, over half of the travel and transport emissions for the NHS are actually dependent on how staff, patients and visitors travel to healthcare settings. I think that's it from me. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, incredibly interesting. Uh, seeing all that the NHS are doing and uh, not without challenges though. Um, thank you very much for sharing with that, that with us today. Um, finally, I'd like to hand over to Mark Dogwell um, from MatWest, who's going to talk through uh, some of the things that we're doing as far as supporting teams and customers making uh, a greener commute. Mark, over to you. Thank you, James. Uh, and, and Dan, if you could take, take to the slide deck, please. And um, so, yeah, Mark Dogwell, I work in the climate propositions team within, in, within the group. Uh, I have responsibility for um, lots of different kind of propositions within the clean transport space, of which commuting clearly is, is one of them. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, next slide, please, Dan. One of the questions I get asked quite a lot is why is the bank involved? Uh, James touched on this right at the start. Climate is absolutely at the core of our, our purpose led strategy. Uh, we've heard from most of the speakers today about transport uh, and how how big and, and the transport being the largest greenhouse gas emitter. So it's, it's right that we focus on this area. So next slide, please. So with that in mind, why focus on commuting? Um, well, we feel it's every employer's obligation to do that. And as, a, as an employer ourselves, NatWest Group, uh, across the UK, we have around 50,000 staff. We have about 19 million customers, circa 19 million customers in the UK. Uh, and, and all of us uh, in the group, all of our customers are commuters, as, as we've heard from, from all the other speakers today. Um, you know, and lots of that commuting is done via car journeys, single occupancy car journeys. Um, some of it's done by public transport, some's done by active travel. Uh, and, and we've been working with Mobility Ways. Uh, I met Mobility Ways about 18 months ago. Uh, I've been working with them uh, to understand how, how they can support. Mark touched on, on some of the work they've been doing for us. Um, but, but if we can move on to the next slide. We've kind of given some thoughts to how do you think about decarbonising, um, uh, the decarbonisation of commuting uh, and, and actually making the best of what's already out there, um, as well as sort of linking with businesses like uh, mobility ways. 
Um, and so for us, it's very much about encouraging active travel. I'll talk in a moment some of the things that, that we are doing in, in more detail. Um, it's about encouraging active travel. It's, in, it's trying to engage staff and, and, and really understand you know, what they're doing. Some of the other speakers have talked about that. Uh, you know, there have been lots of ben commuting benefits, again, touched on by others today from 2020, 2021, during the pandemic. Uh, we shouldn't lose sight of those benefits and, and we should try and lock those in as, as we move through this year and, and, and beyond. Um, a, a key one is data. And, you know, there'll be businesses on this call, some of you, you listening in and actually thinking, how can I do this myself? But if you're in a business district, uh, you know, somewhere across the UK, uh, and it could well be that your neighbours are thinking about doing the same thing. So, again, a bit of collaboration and, and thinking about um, you know, using data between yourselves and your neighbours could start to, to sort of unlock some of the potential for commuting in your town cities, wherever you're located. Electrification does play a huge part in decarbonising commuting. Clearly, uh, you know, the solution to, to our climate crisis is not to convert 37 million internal combustion engine cars to 37 million electric cars, um, but it does have its role to play, as others have touched on again. Um, and think about plotting the solutions, you know, thinking about bike sharing, lift sharing, uh, company car schemes, the infrastructure that's required to support uh, commuting, active travel, uh, you know, electrification uh, infrastructure. Uh, and this is where Mobility Ways can assist. It's where they've, they've supported us. So what have we been doing as a bank? Um, next slide, please, Dan. So how are we supporting our staff? Uh, we, as a group, we signed up to the Climate Group EV100, uh, a global initiative um, bringing uh, companies together that are committed to switching their, their own vehicles to, to electric uh, and uh, that electrification. Uh, we have two car schemes uh, in, in play for our staff, uh, a salary sacrifice car scheme, which is now only hybrid and electric. Uh, uh, you know, our staff cannot get into our combustion engine vehicles through that scheme any longer. Uh, and we also have a colleague car scheme um, through, through our uh, partner brand Lombard, uh, and that uh, allows our staff to get electric and hybrid vehicles through that colleague car scheme as well. We have a, a small fleet of around 300 jobs and needs cars uh, in the UK. We are transitioning those to electric vehicles uh, to support our staff that have made that, that, that change to electric already. Uh, we are installing 600 charge points at some of our larger campuses across the UK. Uh, and you may or may not have seen, you may have not heard, uh, there is an app uh, now out there, was launched in September of last year, the EVA Switch app. Uh, that is supported by NatWest. Uh, it's sponsored by ourselves. Uh, and in the last couple of weeks, we've launched a, a staff version of that app what that app does is, is if you download that to your phone, you run that in your current internal combustion engine car. Every time you drive over a two-week period, it tracks what you do uh, and, and then basically it tells you whether uh, converting to electric would work for you based on the journeys that you make. Um, that's linked into uh, our company car schemes now. Um, so our staff are benefiting from using that app and then it's helping them uh, choose which vehicles might be, might be good for them to, to make that electrification happen. Uh, we have a partnership with Optimus Energy. That's uh, a partnership to support both our customers and our staff. Uh, but for our staff, what that is doing is, is our staff are engaging with Octopus and having home charging points installed so that they can electrify their commute uh, with, with their new EV vehicles. Uh, a change we made in 2020, we increased our cycle to work scheme. We've had a cycle to work scheme for, for many years, uh, but it was capped at £1,000. Uh, we made an increase into that scheme to three thousand pound in 2020. That opens up, uh, you know, the option of, of some good quality e-bikes, uh, and we started to see a lot more uh, kind of people taking that as we as we sort of introduce our return to work uh, and our new ways of working across the group. Uh, we're, we're we're seeing kind of that that option being taken, and, and e-bikes now being a, a viable option on that scheme. Uh, and then uh, obviously. One of the reasons we, we're here with Mobility Ways today, uh, we created a pilot with Mobility Ways in Scotland, as, as Mark alluded to earlier, on our Gogoburn campus. Um, we will be, again, as we go through our new ways of working uh, initiative and staff returning to our, our offices this year, we'll be working with Mobility Ways to, to take that report that, that they've produced for us and, and figure out how that we use that with our staff across Gogoburn, across Edinburgh. Uh, and we'll then be looking how we replicate that for the bigger campuses that we run uh, across the UK again. So that's uh, how we're supporting staff. How are we supporting customers? Next slide, please, Dan. So it's through engagement. Uh, we're doing lots of internal training to our customer-facing staff. Uh, we're holding customer roundtables. 
Uh, we were the principal partner at COP26, which you, you, you may have seen. Uh, there's lots going on in that engagement space, but there are just a few uh, items that I'd call out. Education, it, you know, events like today are, are very much about education and, and helping our customers uh, understand and have that awareness of, of the, the climate and, and the changing transport landscape. Um, and we're also doing lots of work on carbon calculators, uh, which will help that education for customers. Uh, and, and I guess the, the early signs of the work we've been doing in that space, whenever you produce a carbon calculator or, or a, a, a commercial customer of ours uses a carbon calculator, transport features in there. So, so that's helping us with that education process. Uh, and the team that I work in was set up last year very much to, to look at propositions. How do we develop uh, uh, propositions through partnerships, through that collaboration that helps our customers make better climate transport decisions. Some of the customer activity, if we could move on to the next slide, please, Dan. Some of the customer activity, I touched on some of this, um, but, but for car journeys, helping our, our, our staff with car journeys, we've got the, the EV transition through Lombard, as I touched on. We have the telematics partnership through uh, the, the EV8 um, partnership that we have, uh, and again, partnership with Octopus uh, Energy, uh, we have the, the EV charging partnership to support uh, staff and customers there. In the public transport space, uh, we have been supporting electric bus fleet transition uh, across a number of cities in the UK. We're talking and, and working with local authorities, looking at sort of discussing with them what supports needed around that infrastructure that, that's, that's kind of needed to make these ch these changes for, for the decarbonised commuting. Um, and we been doing some early work into MAS Research Mobility as a service. It's not a particularly strong uh, kind of player here in the UK. It works exceedingly well in, in some, some of European countries and, and we're just trying to do some learning from that and, and again working with local authorities just to see how we might support there. And in the active travel space, um, working with LEPS and, and BIDS, business um, districts and, and local enterprise partnerships, what support might we be able to offer there? Also done some investigating work on uh, for, for smaller businesses. Uh, you know, it's, it's 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 quite common for a large organisation like ours to have a bike to work scheme. Not so easy for for SME type size businesses. So we've been doing some work in that space. Uh, a micro mobility um, sharing scheme. So the the, the e bikes, some of the the the, uh, the Santander cycles that you see here in London. Um, you know, trying to figure out what's our role to, to play and to support in that space. So that's some of the activity that we've been uh, undergoing. Next slide, please, Dan. But just coming back to that zero carbon commuting, what are some of the challenges? Uh, I think, you know, various uh, speakers today have called some of these out. But, uh, you know, it, it's an individual's choice to, to change their commuting practice. Clearly, it's, it's on us as employers to, to help with that but it, it, it's not a corporate's choice to make that final move and, and, and change how you do make that commute. Um, so that's worth bearing in mind. Uh, you need that data to support the change uh, and, and you know, the team at Mobility Ways have, have really helped us with that. A number of people have talked today about COVID, that impact on commuting that COVID has had, and, and, and it would be a shame to lose you know, some of the cycle, um, cycling commuting numbers that we've seen improve over the last couple of years. It would be a real shame to see that disappear. Infrastructure is, is always a challenge, whether it's electrification, whether it is active travel. Um, you know, most forms of, of you know, decarbonised transport need some kind of infrastructure support and, and clearly uh, you know, there, there are challenges around that and, and we need to figure out how we support that. The, the costs, the myths and true carbon footprint of electric vehicles is, is always a challenge whenever I speak on, on events such as this and we talk about electric vehicles. You know, people have myths around, there are myths around how good they are, how useful they are, how carbon friendly they are. Um, so they're always going to be challenges in that space. Uh, and then the final one, which I touched on just a moment ago, is MAS really a viable option? Um, uh, and and it's, you know, it's been attempted by some local authorities in the UK, hasn't worked. Uh, others are looking at it again. Um, so, again, it's, it's really kind of understanding, could, could we have a MAS platform that, that works uh, you know, here in the UK? Next slide, please, Dan. So that's the challenges. I won't dwell on this too much because Mark uh, covered this brilliantly for us earlier. So our work with Mobility Ways, uh, as I say, working on our Gogoburn campus. Um, so if we just move to the final slide and, and a summary from myself, um, you know, it is every employer's obligation to focus on zero, zero and carbon commuting, uh, measuring and reporting scope three emissions. Will it be mandatory? Will, will that will that happen? Obviously, scope one, scope two for certain businesses is now. Um, but scope three emissions could well go that way. And therefore, you're going to need 
kind of ways to measure that. Um, as a group, before we engaged with Mobility Ways, uh, I was talking to our, our head of property services. They've been looking at how to do this, trying to figure out how do we measure and, and, and report on, on commuting emissions. Um, when I introduced them to Mobility Ways, you know, that, that was like a, a you know, fantastic moment for them because we were trying to do things on spreadsheets. So that that is a, a you know, a, a requirement let's not use covid as an excuse to do nothing um you know we can't just do that and as i said earlier we've got to try and lock in those benefits that we saw from from commuting and active travel there's still much that we can all do to drive zero carbon commuting uh, and i really do believe as we've sort of been proving over the last couple of years that collaboration partnerships will be key to overcoming all of those challenges that i touched on and, and some of the other speakers have talked about today but that's it from me thank you james brilliant Thank you, everyone, today for, for your contributions and thank you, everyone, for, for participating. Um, now I'd like to open the line up, uh, the line open to any questions people have. Um, so please raise your hand or put questions up onto the chat and I can read them out. We have a, quite a few already. So while we're waiting for any raised hands, I will start with the questions that have been submitted on the portal. Um, first couple are actually for Nat West. So, so Mark, probably for yourself and and they're linked so first question was does your cycle to work scheme enable staff to get adapted cycles for people with disabilities and then there's a linked question to that so were there any reason was there any reason for capping the cycle to work scheme at 3000 given that the government no longer requires a limit some adapted cycles for people with disabilities and cycles that accommodate children on the back uh, can cost more than 3000 um Mark. <laughs> Some really good questions. Uh, I guess uh, I'll be more honest. I don't know uh, why we capped it at three thousand. Um, you know, it was it was a bit of a challenge to get our HR team to to, to move from that original thousand pounds. So we've sort of taken that in 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 as a win to get it up to three thousand. Um, I would I would think that the, the, the adaptive cycles are available. I don't believe that we we've, we've restricted any. Um, but it's a really good point that's made that around the cost of those and, and you know some of the the, the better e-bikes. So um, you know that's it's a fair question and it's probably one that we should take away and, and, and ask of ourselves, James. I think absolutely agree. Uh, thank you for that and thank you for those questions. Uh, the next question, Kirsty, is is for you um, for the Department for Transport and is slightly linked to, to the end of uh, Mark's comments a minute ago. Uh, EVs are much heavier than internal combustion engines due to the necessity to have a large battery pack to get any decent range. As EVs ramp up in number, will infrastructure get better to ensure it's kept fit for purpose? Has any cost analysis been performed on this along with ultra-fast charging infrastructure? Um, where to start? That's a really big topic. Um, so so two, two things to say. Uh, one... Yes, there's lots of research going on within DFT, but um, when it comes to the charging infrastructure, uh, the market is still shaping and there isn't a sort of single set of technologies that are emerging that uh, there hasn't been that sort of consolidation you would expect to see in the marketplace around a single set of technologies yet. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot to play for in, in terms of helping shape the market. And if there are employers of scale who want to get involved with the sorts of companies who are designing the charging facilities, then we can we can use our convening power to, to help do that um, or, or feel free to go directly. Well, the second thing to sort of say is that the UK Infrastructure Bank, uh, which we also launched last year um, and has over 20 billion to invest in, infrastructure that will help us tackle climate change are particularly interested in helping support the rollout of, uh, of this sort of infrastructure and actually um, from their perspective and, and they offer very competitive low rates of, of interest um, from their perspective actually um, working with large employers to uh, on a scalable solution like uh, sort of car park based um, charging um, points would be the sort of thing that they could they could do quite relatively quite easily um, so so I don't have an answer for you in terms of is there is there a solution but there's lots going on in this space and there's lots of different angles through which we're thinking about it thank you Kirsty uh, while I've got you um, 
we have another question uh, specifically for, for you. Uh, the decarbonisation of transport plan commits the government to engaging with large employers on a commute zero. What plans are in place to deliver on this commitment? Um, so uh, what I was trying to say earlier is that uh, my team has been set up to, to lead that work. And um, within DFT at the moment, we're doing some, we're reviewing the evidence uh, to understand what the sort of behavioural elements behind how people, why people choose to commute the way they do, um, to look at the sort of travel pattern data that we have before we launch a scheme where we'll be, we'll be aiming that scheme at employers uh, to help them uh, put in place the sorts of things that will create opportunities for people to, to switch their commutes or to um, help signpost to the sorts of information and data about public service, uh, public transport services and or uh, cycle routes that, that, that will help people sort of give up the car, as it were. Um, but uh, I, you know, personally, and, and at risk of sounding like I'm being a heretic, um, I think we've got to be realistic that actually for some people, a car will always be the best way to get to work and the most efficient in terms of carbon. And for those individuals, something like Mobility Ways is absolutely the future direction of travel and more of what of what these guys are doing. It's it's incredibly inspiring to think that you could put with the with data, the sorts of infrastructure that employers could help put in place for their employees, um, that, that just gets us one step closer to actually being able to sort of achieve net zero without asking people to do the impossible of cycling, you know, fifty miles to get to the office. Thank you very much. Um, a question for everyone. Uh, how accurate are Scope 3 emissions calculated for employee commuting? Are companies using actual miles travelled, bearing in mind that commuting is usually not recorded through internal software, e.g. expenses, or using an average based on postcodes and a number of office days? Maybe one for mobility ways to start with. I'll probably pass that over to Kirsty very quickly. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, in, in terms of the ACE cell and the commute emissions, we use, it is an average. It is an average on purpose. And we take the postcode, uh, sorry, the travel survey data, and we apply national averages that are generated by the government on an annual basis, whether that is average distance travelled, average mode travelled. The idea is, is to make sure that for organisations, this is not onerous. We want to understand a, uh, and create a baseline position of kilograms of CO2e that are, are being generated by each employer so that we can drive that number down. And whether the number of staff at, at that location goes up or down, it doesn't matter, it's still an average. What we don't want is organisations tying themselves up in knots, trying to work out to the most finite detail what this number is. Um, so it, the, the short answer is, from our perspective, it is an average, um, but, but Kirsty may, may have other thoughts and views. Um, no, I think, I think, I think that's, that's right, Mark. It is an average. Um, and, it, and it's the best set of, I mean, the DFT's statistical releases are the industry standard and are the best set of data available. Um, but it's, for me, it's that classic quote, you know, best being the enemy of the good. Uh, we could get really tied up in lots trying to get to a, a precision around data that is counterproductive in terms of actually helping win hearts and minds. And that feels to me like the more immediate challenge is how do you help people understand their choices? And and that's 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 the thing we can do today. We don't need to be held back on getting on with that. And actually mobility ways helps organisation. You know, m my understanding is that you help employers get into those conversations by providing them with enough data to have an informed view, to pitch it correctly, to think about the sorts of nuances and challenges that a workforce might face. I mean I don't know about anybody else in this call. I became a mum during lockdown. The idea of me giving up my car now is is is, is quite frankly a dream. Um, it will have to wait for a few years because I can't navigate a lot of city centres with a change bag, uh, a toddler who wants to scream at people who I don't really feel like taking on public transport and bringing that to everybody else. You know? and, and actually, if I had to drive to one of DFT's locations outside of London where I can't just cycle into the office, Using my car would be something I'd, I'd have to do. But if DFT were signposting to me, there's five other people who, along the way, you can pick them up, drop them in with you. They're going to be doing a similar work pattern to you. 
And, and what's more, you, you've probably both got children, so you can have a good moan about why the back seat's so dirty. I'd quite enjoy that. I mean, I, I was talking to Ali from from the company earlier this week, and one of the things he said to me that really, really stuck with me. So there's lots of CSR reasons why you would do something like this, but actually from a HR workforce personnel perspective, one of the one of the statistics he sort of threw at me, which I can't remember right now, and I'm kicking myself that I can't, is employee attrition rates can actually sometimes come down to whether somebody has an easy commute and whether it fits with their life. And for lots of people who moved jobs during COVID, actually the reality of going back to hybrid working or office-based or work, um, workplace-based working uh, may be forcing some people to rethink their choices. And, and actually the cost of recruitment, the cost of onboarding, the cost of staff turnover, it, and, and in the current labour market, even if you had a single digit percentage point on that for, for a, a large scale employer, the, the business case is already made for doing something in this space, regardless of the environmental benefits it will bring. Um, but I'd like to think you were doing it for the environmental benefits, but uh, if, if, you, if you need to convince people who are harder edged uh, and more driven by financial bottom lines, then I think that's a pretty compelling one to go after. Thank you for that, Kirsty. Dan, just checking, we don't have any raised hands at the moment. Uh, no, we don't currently have any raised hands. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, I think we've got a couple more minutes, so maybe uh, just one final question. Um, looking through, the problem with car sharing is security of knowing how safe you are in a car and entering or allowing a stranger into the car. What is the vetting process of the people in the scheme? I think I should probably take that one. Um, so, okay, I think there's a number of, of, of aspects to this. The first is that when we set up organisational schemes, lift share schemes, we are setting them up for an employer. And the employer has the choice of making that what we call a closed scheme. So staff can only share with other members of staff or allow their members of staff to make that decision for themselves. Do they just want to share with colleagues who, of course, are all vetted by the organisation or are they happy to share with others outside the organisation? And typically it's about 50-50 in terms of, of people's approaches to that. When we've done membership surveys, which I, I find really interesting, the issue of safety amongst the sort of 700,000 odd members that, that we've had over the years is very, do, very low down on the list of concerns. It is rightly the concern of employers because we have an obligation as employers to look after the well, well-being of our staff. But there are, through the Lift Share programme, the opportunity to um, add your journey or journeys onto the system. Um, you're not giving away lots of details about location. You have the opportunity to see people who potentially you could match with, to have conversations with those people, and to make a judgment on whether you feel comfortable to share with those individuals. So on top of that, lots of, of health and safety information, which, which for a lot, of, a lot of it really is common sense. The last thing I would say, and this is not in any way being flippant, is after 23 years and 700,000 members, we have never had an incident involving lift sharing. Um, so that is not to say that it isn't important and we mustn't focus on it and we must make sure people uh, use their common sense in, in using the service um, but it is essentially a safe way of travelling. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to everyone who's participated today. I notice we're right at time now. Thank you for all the questions. I'm very sorry we haven't managed to get through all of them. Um, thank you, everyone, for participating today. It's been a very, very, very interesting event. Some of the messages I've been getting through through the event have been very interesting as well. Um, we will endeavour to follow up where, where we can do um, and with that, I'll bring the call to a close. Thanks very much.